All right, what a, what a sweet, sweet time to be able to be in the presence of the Lord and worship Him and just get washed in the, in the scriptures through song and, and just allow the Spirit of God to touch our hearts and we've only just begun. We've got a great glimpse at Jesus Christ as we move through the rest of hopefully chapter 9. Chapter 9 is a super long chapter, 62 verses. We're going to try and pick it up in verse, well, we'll pick it up in verse 37, try to make our way down to the end. Um, but uh, that's where we're going to be studying tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence and to worship you and to declare your goodness and to be refreshed. Lord, in light of uh, these truths, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear from you, to see you as you really are and the way you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, correct any traditions that maybe are not so biblical. Correct any preconceived ideas or even things that we want you to be like that you're not. We pray that we would just see you for who you are and that we would um, let, you, let you be Lord of our life in that way because, Lord, that is the best. And, um, and I just pray you would stretch our hearts and our minds and you would change opinions and turn us around if need be tonight as we look into your word. In your name we pray, amen. All right, turn with me over to Luke chapter 9. We're going to pick up at verse 37. And the title is Six Essential Teachings About the Kingdom of God. So Luke chapter 9. Of course, we came out of the transfiguration um, that had happened um, either Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. Um, So one of those two locations are the the sites that are usually um, expected they had uh, are, are believed. They had an amazing experience where the Lord basically just um, pulled back the veil of human flesh and his glory was manifested to them. And the, gl- the miracle, you do know this, the miracle is not that his glory was seen. The miracle has been that it's been veiled. <laughs> That's the miracle, right? Because... For the Lord, the most natural, supernatural thing is for his glory to show. But when he took on human flesh, that miraculous incarnation had been veiling that glory. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, that was peeled back, and they saw the great glory of the Lord, and they were amazed. As we come into this section of Scripture, Jesus is going to announce that he's going to be crucified And he's going to set his face towards Jerusalem. In other words, he's going to go to the cross no matter what. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. He will rise from the dead three days later. He's taught his disciples in the multitude that this is coming, but they're not having an easy time receiving it because it's not what they anticipated. It's not what they expected. Now, we can look back now and we can say, well, there was Isaiah 53, there was Psalm 22, there was all the, I don't know, the, the lambs and the goats and the bulls that were being sacrificed every day in the temple. How could they not think that the coming of the Messiah would result in him not being crucified? And really, I think if we're honest, you step back, It's not very understandable. They're expecting the establishment of the kingdom. And there were these passages, and there was this typology, but it was still expected he was going to come and triumphantly defeat all of their enemies, physical ones and spiritual ones, and that he would rule and reign upon the earth, and they would be a glorious nation, and that the nations of the earth would flood to them. And this is what they expect, because this is what the Word of God says. So it is understandable that they're having to go through this transition because he's going to be rejected as their king. And the kingdom will not be established in its physical sense. And this is what the Lord said to Pilate. Um, my men aren't going to fight. That's a different kind of a kingdom. So this is why there is this difficulty. And we may look at some of the things we're going to see about them. And we think, how could they do this? But really, if you just ponder a little longer and think about your own life, you'll say... Not so different, which I find encouragement in, that they're making mistakes as the apostles, this is not the B team, this is the apostles, and they're making mistakes, 
and the Lord is still using them, and he is still correcting them. So let's look at this, these um, six essentials of the kingdom of God. We begin looking at verses 37 through 42, with the first one, and it's the necessity of faith and prayer. Now what happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out, convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I, I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw himself down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. So this glorious scene is taking place up in the mountain, and you have this dark, shadowy scene going on down in the plains. You know, you have some people that are at an all-time high in their spiritual walk and experience with God, and you have others that are experiencing the most devastating and disappointing moments of their life. The man finally tracked down the disciples, and the disciples are unable to help at all. And so when Jesus comes, he goes straight to him and he asks for help. And the issue is faith and prayer. We find out in Mark's account that the disciples come and say, why couldn't we do this? Because previously they have had experience of casting out demons, remember? They come back and they're like, wow, demons were cast out on your name. And Jesus wasn't even in, in close proximity to them. They said, we cast out demons in your name. It's amazing what took place. There were high fives going around for the great things they had done. They had healed people. And yet, here on this occasion, it's not happening. And so they ask him, why couldn't this happen? And he says, this kind comes out with prayer and fasting. So there was something that was unique about this possession that Jesus says, you've got to be in prayer, you've got to be fasting, you've got to be seeking the Spirit of the Lord and his help. So the question then is, should have they stopped and had a prayer meeting when, the fa when this father, this desperate father came? Should they say, hang on, time out. We discern this is a different kind of a demon. We need to have a prayer and fasting meeting before we attempt to do this. I don't think that's the answer. So what is the answer? Is that they live in the attitude and in the practice of prayer and fasting. That they are so connected with Jesus that when the moment comes, they are ready for that moment and they are not taken by surprise. Which of us knows when the evil day is coming? This is what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, that we should put on the armor of God, that we should be ready for the evil day. What's the evil day? What day is that? Is that a Monday? If you're a pastor, it might be a Monday. But, I mean, what's the evil day? Is, is it, you know, what day is the, the, the day? We don't know what the evil day is, do we? It's not on our calendar. Nobody's put it on, you know, as a, you know, a national holiday, evil day, day. We don't know when the evil day is going to come. So we need to, every day we need to suit up. Every day we need to put on the full armor of God that we might be able to stand in the evil day. Not every day is evil day. Aren't you glad? And, and really, I mean, you know, it seems like you can almost come in waves. It seems like it comes in seasons. But wow, aren't we glad that it's not every day? But because we don't know what day it is, we must be suited up and prepared every day. Every day we must be in this connection with the Lord, this devotional life of ours, so, um, I guess, just in tune that we're ready for whatever challenges may 
come our way. Warren Wiersbe put it like this, Jesus had already given them authority to cast out demons. The authority that Jesus had given them was effective, was effective only if exercised by faith, but faith must be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. Another says, it isn't that prayer and fasting makes us more worthy to cast out demons. It's that prayer and fasting draws us closer to the heart of God, that they put us more in line with his power. They are an expression of our total dependence on him. So no, it wasn't that they needed to call a prayer meeting. It's that the prayer meeting should have already been going on. There already should have been that connection. And who isn't challenged by that? That we're ready each and every day. Do you know when your neighbor's going to come knocking on your door at 3 a.m. in a desperate moment because everything has gone right? We've had it happen. How do you, how do you know when that's going to happen? How do you know when you're going to get the call from your friend or a family member? And so we must be prayed up. We must be fasted up. We must be connected up with Jesus so that we are ready for that moment. So apart from implicit trust, which prayer and fasting communicate and speak of, we will never be effective in seeing the kingdom of God beaten back in the darkness um, in, in the light of the Lord, shining on that darkness and dispelling it. It's not, it's not that we need to be more powerful. It's that we need to be more connected with the heart and the mind and the power of the Lord. And that's what's needed is to tap into his strength, is to tap into his power, is to pa pa tap into his discernment. And apart from spending time with the Lord, prayer and fasting, how will we ever have those things present we can know them and that we need them but we must walk in that discipline of having that and that should serve as a great encouragement to all of us not just for ourselves but for those that are around us those that we're going to come in contact with that we are we got the conversation going on with Jesus and we're ready to leave that conversation with him and communicate all of that to those people that are around us. So what, what a scene this must have been, what joy there must have been in this father to see his son given back to him in perfect health. You know, some have uh, looked at this, I th I, it's, it's, uh, I th it's either Matthew or Mark refers to this, as, I think it's Matthew, as um, the epileptic fits. And so some have con Included that this wasn't really a demonic thing. It was epilepsy. And then even worse than that, some have said that epilepsy is a manifestation of demonic possession. That, that is just really bad Bible um, teaching, if you can call it even teaching. It, it, this is a spirit. And the way in which this spirit was manifesting itself was like some that would have epilepsy. That, that, those type of symptoms. But it's clear that this was a demon-possessed experience and not a physical um, uh, problem. So we'll move on, verse 43. We come to the, the second necessity. So the first necessity is that we need to have faith. We need to have prayer. Second one is the necessity of the cross. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples... I like this. Let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. They should have asked. They should have got over their little pride trip of I don't want to ask because if I ask, then everybody's going to know that I don't know. So I'm not going to ask because I want to act like I know what he's talking about. I don't want to be looking like the person that didn't have these things sink down into my ears. And so they just kind of nodded with great affirmation. Yes, yes, yes. What in the world is he talking about? But it was hidden from their eyes course they see it clearly after the resurrection you maybe even think about you know the Emmaus road and those disciples that walked with them and when Jesus finally broke bread and handed it out their eyes were open and they saw 
him for who he was. So there's something going on there. It's hard to know exactly what this, this um, hiding is that the Lord is doing, but it's there. They don't fully understand it, and they are afraid to ask questions. And from what we're going to read, we can see that pride was an issue that they were dealing with around this time. So that's why I'm saying maybe this was a pride issue. So Jesus is telling them, I'm going to be betrayed, and I am going to go through incredible difficulties. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Let this sink into your head. He's already told them previously that he would be delivered up and that he would be crucified. And this was something that happened there at the, uh, the confession that he was the Messiah. So he's like, get this into your head. Things are going to go far differently than you are anticipating. They're not anticipating betrayal. They are anticipating, you know, widespread devotion. That's what they're anticipating is going to take place. They're not anticipating that he's going to be rejected. They're anticipating that he's going to be lifted up and everybody is going to come to see him for who he really is and that he will drive out the Romans. He will deliver them from their, their heavy hand and their, their fierce ways and this glorious kingdom is going to be established. And when we have an idea of what a certain thing means um, in Scripture, it's really hard for us if it means something else to hear it, isn't it? Have you, how many of you have ever had to come, uh, you, probably all of us, and I'll, my hand's already raised up, how many of you have ever had to come to a different conclusion about a passage or the ways of the Lord than which you previously held? Yeah, I mean, if you study Scripture for any amount of time, you can. Now, um, I have this unique, you know, thing of writing everything down that I'm going to say. So when I go back to teach it again, I'm like, what? Like, I mean, I've got this, you know, I, I, stuff I'm like, why did I say that? And I cross it out. Like, this isn't something. Why, why would I put that in there? And so there are things that we, we, we grow. We understand. We spend more time in the presence of Jesus. We understand his character, his nature, and the word more. And so it is an important thing that we, we, we hold the truth of God's word, you know, boldly and firmly, but yet when we're wrong, that we allow ourselves to be uh, corrected by the word of God. And they're being corrected, but they're, they just can't see it. They can't understand it. They were set in their way of which things were going to finish out with Jesus and they couldn't understand when he was saying, I'm going to be betrayed. Get, let, let it sink into your, your thick heads. I'm going to be rejected. Nah, that's not going to happen. Clearly, he means something else. It's deeper, but he's not going to be rejected. And so, in some ways, there are this, this mentality that existed with the disciples that Jesus would not have to go and suffer still exists in the church today. There are those that say that if you're walking close with Jesus, you're walking in full faith with the Lord, that you will not suffer. And it's just not true. It's not biblical. I mean, we are told that we will suffer. We are told that hard things are going to go on. And so we have those that say, well, if you just had enough faith and if you had enough um, you know, belief, then you wouldn't ever have a financial need or a health need because these things would just, they would be taken care of. This is not what the Bible teaches. We are told to pray for each other when we're sick, to call for um, the elders to anoint with oil and to pray. We have up front, anybody comes every week, we pray for people to be healed. We have no problem praying for people to be healed. And sometimes God shows up and he heals them according to his perfect will. And so we pray. But we never once tell people, now if you have enough faith, you're going to be healed. And if you don't, well then that's a problem. You don't have enough faith. And so maybe next week, you know, you can come with more faith. And, you know, you can always 
you know, show that faith by writing a really large check to the church. And how big is your, your faith? Well, you know, then write your check accordingly. And th this is what people do to people that are desperate because they have this idea that we should never have to have any kind of suffering or any kind of difficulty. It is not what the Bible says, and I think it does so much damage. Oh, I am all for believing, and I know that my faith can grow more. I'm not saying I've arrived at some perfect faith. I know I can grow, and I should be challenged to have greater faith in the Lord than I do. But that is a far cry from this idea that you, as a believer, should never suffer or never go through difficulty or never go through hardship. And so... It even gets to the place where the word faith movement, word faith. In the beginning, God created this world and he spoke things into existence and we were created in the image of God. And because we're created in the image of God, we have the same ability to speak a reality into existence, word faith. My words and my great faith will speak something into existence. So, you have to be careful of what you're going to say. If you say something negative about what may happen, I think I might be getting cold. Oh, don't say that. Don't. You're speaking in existence. No, that's not the way it works. And so I believe I, you know, I want to have this thing. I want this house. I want this. And so I, I speak. I, I just I name it and I claim it. I speak these things out. And that becomes mine. This teaching is so prevalent. Now, I'm not trying to say these people are, are evil, some cases, maybe people have really manipulated this and have uh, seen it as a money-making scheme. And in other cases, maybe they just have landed upon some bad theology. But it is bad theology. It is bad teaching. So you don't ever have to be worried about that. If you're getting a cold, it's okay to say, I have a cold. It's all right to say that. It's not going to make you have a cold. Or, you know, any of, of those types of things. Because, I mean, I mean honestly... I want you to think about that. What kind of father do we have that if we say the wrong thing, it becomes our reality even if we're not after or don't want it and it's not the best thing for us? Do you do that with your kids? I don't think you do that with your kids. And if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the father give? Right? So, if, if you've been under that teaching or you've been you know, in the, under this kind of idea that you, you have the miserable life you do because you don't have enough faith, I just want you to, to be liberated and realize we go through trials and tribulations. Part of following Jesus is that we're going to have difficulties. We've been appointed to this. We've been called to this. And so difficulties come. But there are those that say, no, 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 no cross, no suffering. It's only a life of blessing and that's it. Well, I think all of us have lived long enough to know that is not reality. And honestly, if it was true that if we just had enough faith that we would never get sick and we would never die, then can we please have at least one believer that's 500 years old? I mean, just give me one believer that's 750 years old, one believer in 2,000 years of the church's history that's really landed upon this which is possible. But you know, the reality is we're just a few months ahead of the statistics of death rate of those that don't believe in our same country. It's just relatively the same kind of a death rate, dying around the same age. So... I just would encourage you to understand that even like the disciples like, no, it's not going to be that. It's going to be a glory street. It's going to be a blessing. It's going to be wonderful. Now listen, I'm not saying our salvation is short and that there, it isn't blessing and it isn't wonderful, but the idea that we never have to suffer or that somehow our words are going to create a terrible reality for us because it's a lack of faith. Be liberated from that tonight. Now, throughout church history, the challenge has been to keep the cross at the center. That's been the challenge. When the church has lost sight of the cross, it's not a pretty thing. I'll give you a couple of examples, even our own day. Not understanding the cross leads people to look to other means for salvation. 
When we lose sight of the cross and all that happened on the cross, we begin to look to other things, other means, my own works maybe. Not understanding the cross leads people into a life of carnality and worldliness, mediocrity and half-heartedness in the Christian faith. Because when the cross of Jesus Christ is right in front of you and you are re being reminded of the great love of the Lord and how he died on the cross for us, it's really hard to just go embrace a life of mediocrity and carnality knowing that Jesus died for those very things. So the better we understand the cross, the holier our lives will be. Not understanding the cross has led to some abandoning the Great Commission. When we fail to see that Jesus died on the cross to save the world from sin, when that becomes something that's in the background of our thoughts, then why do I need to press ahead and share the gospel? Why do I need to open my mouth and talk? When we fail to see how ugly sin is and that it's so ugly that the Father would even pour out his wrath upon his Son upon the cross... When we lose sight of that, then we lose sight of the need to open our mouths and, mouths and speak as we ought the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not understanding the cross has led to a, deva a devaluing of the unity of the church. We talked about this a few weeks ago, that Jesus died on the cross not only to atone for our sins, but Jesus died on the cross to make the two men one. And when we start to rip and tear the body of Christ apart, each other, and we start to divide this, it is a clear indication that the cross of Jesus Christ means too little to us. Because when we realize he hung on the cross to unite us, the last thing we want to try and do is undo what Jesus did. And so we need to keep a, this you know, central focus of the cross ever before us. It is not off to the you know, right, not off to the left, not off you know, in the foreground or the back. It is right here. It's right front and center. And when we do, then we will walk in holiness and we will be sharing the gospel and we will be loving on one another and putting up with one another because when I look at you or you look at me or we look at each other or we look at them or they look at us and we see our differences and we think about just driving a wedge, we'll say, wait a minute. Mm -mm. Jesus died to make us one. I'm not going to do that. I'll just put up with that brother or sister. I'm just going to love them anyway. And we move on and we maintain the unity of the body of Christ. So, the necessity of faith and prayer. And here we see the necessity of the cross. If Jesus didn't go to the cross, then we're still going to be dead in our sin and we're still trying, we would still be offering up sacrifices, waiting for that Lamb of God to be that once for all sacrifice. But of course he did come. As we move on, verses 46 through 48, we come to our third point, three of six, and this is the necessity of humility. Then a dispute among them arose among them. Remember I said pride issue? Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you among you all will be great. So they were fighting. Other accounts tell us this, that they were fighting over who, which of them was going to be the greatest. Can you imagine the way that conversation must have sounded? Now, listen, the text does not say it, but let me just give a hypothetical, okay? Hey, Jesus said he was going to be betrayed and he was going to be delivered up. Hmm. If he's betrayed and delivered up, I wonder who's going to step in. I wonder who's going to be his number two. I've got an idea. I think I should be his number two. And, you know, you know, I was thinking about what Jesus said, and I'm thinking maybe I should be number two. You're not. You think you're going to be number You would never be number two. 
I think I'm going to be number two. No, you're not going to be number two. Well, we know it's not this guy, and we know it's not that guy. I mean, and there was a dispute as they fought over who among them was going to come to that second position, was going to be in that leadership position. And so they were arguing. They were fighting over this. And so Jesus says, like, okay, so you guys like to fight about who's going to be the greatest. And he brings a little child and sets the child right there in the midst. And he says, and this is not a childlike faith, okay? Jesus uses children to teach different points and different principles. This is not have simple faith like a child. Um, this is... It's different. This is rather receive this child who has no status and can add nothing to your name and cannot help your cause to be number two. Reach out and embrace those that can't do anything for you. You want to be great in the kingdom? Then embrace those that are not going to help your cause. I mean, you want to you embrace somebody that's full of power and strength and they have resource like that rich young ruler. Let's get him. Now, if I receive him, now, all of a sudden, I've got something to work with. He's respected in the community. He has resources. That's who I need to get to know real well. And Jesus says, no, if you want to be great in my kingdom, get near the people that can do absolutely nothing for you, and then you'll be great. You notice Jesus doesn't say, don't be great. He's not saying that that is a, a bad thing. He's rebuking the thought of greatness by correcting the concept of what it means to be great. You should want to be great. But if you're going to be great, it means you are going to be the least. So go be great. Which in Jesus' vocabulary means what? Go be least. You can be great. He's not saying don't be great. Because truly when you are a servant of all, you are great in the kingdom of God, as he would say it. So the necessity of humility, the necessity to make certain that we are reaching out to people not based upon what they can add to us, what they can bring to the table for us, the saying we have. It's like, I have something to bring to the table for you, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's love, and that's fellowship. And so... He's rebuking them, and he is giving them an example. It makes us think of the teaching that is found in the book, the epistle of James, right? In James, he says, you know, you have people in the congregation, and there, you know, there's those that are, you know, it's a widow, it's an orphan, they don't have money, they're not dressed up well, they're not going to give you a job, they're not going to offer anything that's going to help you. And they're sitting down. And when you see somebody who comes in, and they're a landowner, and they're wealthy, and they do hire, all of a sudden, you start to show all kinds of kindness, and you show partiality. You tell them, hey, friend, come up front, and sit down up front. We've got a special seat from you. Oh, hey, little kid, get out of the way. Would you? Yeah, you too, lady. Move on over. I don't, in the back then. Stand in the back. And this is what was going on in the church. And, of course, James rebukes him. He's like, hey, you're inviting the guy that, you know, is taking you to court and is not paying you your wages. You're showing all kinds of kindness to him. It doesn't even make sense what you're doing. But they were clearly, the, the issue James was addressing, they were after what could benefit them. And that is something we must make certain that never happens based upon a person's position um, that they may have in the community, based upon a person's education, based upon a person's wealth, based upon a person's uh, you know, uh, uh, gifts and abilities, based upon the way a person looks. These should not be a part of the body of Christ. It should not matter who you are, you should have a place to sit in our midst. They should be a place in your house, in your life. So to be great is a one who's going to be the servant of all and is going to reach out to those that can do nothing for them. But we can do something for them. This is exactly how Jesus lived his life. As a matter of fact, if you need any further evidence that Jesus brings people close to him that can offer nothing to him, look in the mirror when you get home. 
you'll see yourself. What can you really add to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? What can you add to the, to the creator of the universe? He is self-sufficient. He needs nothing from you. You cannot make him greater. You cannot help him out. Well, I'm going to say I can serve him. Listen, the Lord can find somebody else. And so we need to understand, although we're loved of the Lord, what we see him modeling is that he brings people like you and me right into his midst, and he calls us friend. And he says, here, I want to use you. And so this is what Jesus was doing with these guys. They probably didn't catch it, did they? Well, you 12 are the kids. You 12 are the kids I brought into my midst. And this is the way you should be living. This is the way you should be walking. So, be a servant. Great example of this, and I'll just give it to you to read on your own, is found in John chapter 13. This is where Jesus, um, right before he's about to be arrested, the night of the Passover meal, he goes in there, um, hours away from crucifixion, and he washes the disciples' feet. And he ministers to them and he serves them. They were still fighting over who was going to be the greatest. Washing people's feet was considered the least um, job in the house. So if you had five servants, the servant who had the least amount of rank was going to wash feet. And so they all came in. They're fighting over who's greatest. It was customary to wash feet. Are they going to wash is Peter going to wash John's feet? Is John going to you know, wash Thomas' feet? Of course not. Because the minute they begin to wash one another's feet, they're admitting, I am the you know, least significant person in this room. And so the greatest of them all, God himself in the flesh, begins to wash feet. And so he speaks to them. He says, all right. This is the way it's done, boys. And if you see this, then happy are you if you know these things and what? Do them. Serve. So Jesus is such a perfect example of this. Let's keep on moving on. Come to our fourth point in verses 49 and 50, the necessity of unity. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. So, John, um, one of the sons of thunder, right? You, you get an idea. It's like, hey, uh, I saw this guy. He doesn't travel with us. He has a different flight itinerary than ours. And so, uh, we know that we're truly the only committed ones and the only ones that probably are the real deal. So, when I saw somebody else using your name and casting out demons... Don't think of the sons, you know, seven sons of Sceva. Don't think of, some, think of somebody who potentially has had an encounter with the Lord or he has experienced this. Then he's going around doing what the Lord's been doing, even what the disciples are doing. But John doesn't like it. Because this, based upon the context of what we're reading, this kind of eats in a little bit to his, his credibility, right? You're taking a little bit of my, my thunder. I mean, if you're doing this, he might begin to think that you should be number two. Now, I, obviously, I'm injecting a little bit of motivation there and what was going through his mind, but the Lord is not happy with it. He says, don't forbid him. Don't, don't do that. Please don't do that. And um, the word here, um, so, oh, how far off do I want to get into this? Um, so you have New King James that's, best, that's based upon a set of Greek manuscripts. You have, um, let's say, the New American Standard Bible that's set upon a manuscripts, and they will, they will pull, and sometimes you'll find differences, and the differences are quite minimal, and I think this is a great example. So the New King James has this as, and we forbade him, and the idea is we stopped him once. Boom, point in time, we said stop it, and then we turned around and walked away, okay? That's the idea. That this, this word would be like an aorist word if you're familiar with the Greek. So it's talking about past tense events. And they say, we forbade him. But the New American Standard Bible uses it differently. And it, it has uh, the tense of imperfect, which is ongoing action. 
So it would be, and we were forbidding him. We didn't just say, hey, don't do that and walk away. We, we got into a conversation with this guy. And we told him over and over and over and over again not to do this. So I, I just, I th you know, we talk about some different manuscripts and they, they have differences. We're talking about some pretty, you know, we're talking about a nuance of a past tense, you know, verb. And so it does not change our faith or doctrine whatsoever. So these are the types of things. But it is interesting to think that, you know, that there might have been more energy in him stopping this guy from casting out demons than um, just... The idea of we told him to stop and we did it once and it was over. But Jesus is like, listen, if he's not against us, he's on our side. Unity. I mean, why are you trying to divide us? And I think the application comes to us is that we need to look past our own tradition, our own denomination, our own affiliation, and not dismiss other groups of believers that are faithfully following the Lord, but maybe they have a different name over uh, the building that you go into worship. And down through the ages, this has been a problem, is that sectarianism that says, if you don't do it like us, just like us, then, man, you're doing it wrong. And I, I can tell you that you, when I began 26 years ago, there was more of that in me than I would like to admit. I um, mean, I pray that God continues to mellow me out and get me on that right, that right track. You know, if somebody wants to, obviously, you know, what, how do we like to teach here? We like to teach from book to book, cover to cover, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's the way we like to do it. But, you know, the guy down the road who wants to just open the Bible and teach a topic and it's a solid biblical study, I have no fight with that guy. I want to pray for that guy. And I want to pray for what he's doing that it will prosper and that it will grow. Now he thinks the best way to approach that is maybe by a topical method. I think the best way to approach it is by um, you know, going um, book by book. And so we've got a distinction. Is this? Lord, I told him to never teach the Bible again because he doesn't teach chapter by chapter. I'm pretty sure Jesus would say, let's not do that, okay? Let's let him continue ministering as he is. You know, or we could, it gets into the music style, right? So should it be, you know, uh, a, a worship band? Or should it be uh, a cappella? Or should it be an organ? Or should it be a piano? And, you know, so we have these things. Well, you know, it needs to be, and here's the funny thing about music and worship. I, this is what a conclusion I've come to. We all like it loud, but we just like our instrument loud. That, that's really the truth. Don't tell me that when they spend $150,000 on an organ, they don't want to hear that thing rattle the rafters of that building. They do. You go into those places, and that thing is just like, man, everything is shaking. But it's not loud. It's just a glorious sound. They love that. Okay, fine, love it. And they come in, and some people hear a guitar. They hate the guitar. That's too loud. Okay, so we have our, our likes and our dislikes about music. Praise the Lord. You, there are plenty of places that have, you can, if you just like it a cappella, you, you, hopefully there's a solid church that's preaching the word and the gospel and is loving people, and you can, you can feel comfortable there. But these are not the things that we divide over. These are not the things that we divide over. What instrument that we use or whether we use instruments or not, this is not a reason to argue and to fight and, and to divide with each other. And we can make a really long list of all of these things, whether it's the name or the way we handle the word of God, or it's the way we dress when we come to church, and the list goes on and on and on. And I guess you probably could throw masks in there now as of 2020, right? I'll let you do whatever you want with that. I'm not touching it. So, unity. Now, don't forbid him. Let him keep on doing what he's doing. We're, we're on the same team, John. We don't need to stop this guy. Oh, okay, I got you, Lord. I, and, you know, what is it? Is it fear that's causing him to do this? Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's a desire for standing. Um, we just need to hold, I mean, we need to hold tight to 
core doctrine, those cardinal doctrines of the faith. Um, and really, in this chapter, I mean, chapter 9, it, and one author puts it this way, it argues for the exactness in the church's Christology and the broadness in its ecclesiology, referring to churches. So when it comes to Christ, I mean, we are precise. I mean, we are using specific words to say who he is. But when it comes to how the church functions, yet keeping that one that has been revealed in Scripture in focus and true to the Word of God, we need to be a little more generous with each other. Let's move on, verses 51 through 56, point number five. Now it came to pass, come to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So this becomes a, a significant change, actually, in, in, um, in Luke's uh, gospel here. And sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, there they are, the sons of thunder, they saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? <laughs> but he turned and rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Oh, yeah, save them. That's right. Yeah, I just got messed up for a second. I save them or scorch them. I just get that me me messed up sometimes. And I just thought we were up on the mountain with Elijah, and I was just feeling an Elijah moment myself, and I don't like the way they treated you, and, you know, they don't want to take time for you. So I was just thinking we should just kill them all. But if you don't want to do that, that's fine. We'll just go on to another town. Patient love. What? And I say patient love because if you want, read Acts chapter 8. What happens in Acts chapter 8? Revival breaks out here, in Samaria, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. It's interesting. When they are saved and Philip is leading this revival that's going on in Samaria, and all of these people are getting saved and they're baptizing them, they call for somebody, they call for some of the apostles to come and lay hands on them that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who do they call? Peter and John. And he comes back to this town, and now he's laying hands on them to receive the spirit fire rather than the scorch them, kill them fire. We need to be patient. And God knows what he wanted to do. We need to be loving. These guys, they were growing in the love department, right? And so quite, quite a... Quite a change. Now, as we begin chapter 9, verse 51, all the way through about, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, Luke 9, 51, all the way through Luke 18, verse 34, um, this whole section is not found in Matthew or Mark. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you've ever read those, you've realized immediately these are very, very similar. Why is that? Well, they probably were borrowing from the same oral tradition, or maybe there was even a, um, an ancient document that they looked at and they read upon. They were inspired of the Holy Spirit. I am not diminishing that aspect at all. But it seems like they read maybe or were hearing the same oral tradition. They put it down. But now when we get to uh, chapter 9, verse 50, 51, all the way through 1834, you don't find this in Ma Mark and Matthew. And so this is some different material. And so it's one of the larger sections that differs from the other Gospels. Um, and so just a little, little reading note for you to have there. So, yeah, we need to walk in patient love. Maybe there's somebody that you want to scorch. But the Lord is just saying, just hang out. Just, just, just hang on. Just wait. John, you're coming back to this town, but you're... <laughs> You're going to be doing something far different. You're going to be baptizing them with the Holy Spirit and fire, not just calling down fire. And so maybe there's even somebody you know. It's like, man, this person, my parent, my son, my daughter, my aunt, my uncle, my sibling, this individual, man, if I could have called fire down on them, I would have called fire down on them. And now look, be patient, love them, 
and look for the Lord to, to bring them to himself. We close it here in verses 57 through 62. It's our last point, and we see the necessity of being single-minded. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, and others also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to them, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The necessity of being single-minded. Now we read these things, we're like, well, he can't even bury his dad. Listen, probably what's meant here is that you know, my dad will be dying sometime in the near future. And it's not customary for me to leave. The culture of the day says don't leave, so let's wait till he dies, um, and then we will. It, it's very likely the, his father wasn't even sick. So it's an excuse. Follow me. Ah, i got a, got a funeral to go to sometime in the near future. I can't do this. I've just got a, I've got a commitment to the family. To another person, you know, I'll follow you. I'm ready to go. All right, let's go. Well, I'm, get, I'm having some people over to my house. I just don't know if I can follow you right now. And so the Lord says, if you want to follow me, put your hand on the plow, then don't look back. If you say you want to follow me, then don't give me your excuses for why you don't want to follow me. If you want to follow Jesus, then he's happy and delighted to have you and me follow him. But we shouldn't be looking back at other things that would cause our effectiveness in plowing in the kingdom of God or looking back to the things that we left behind and longing after them rather than being totally sold out for the kingdom of God. A single mindset. Of course, we're familiar with that passage where Jesus said, listen, if you love your your parents more than you love me, then you're not worthy to follow me. So the Lord calls us to complete and total devotion. This is the biblical Jesus. And this is what the biblical Jesus wants from us, is that we will follow him with our whole heart. We'll give up the comforts of normal living. We'll allow family relationships. We won't allow family relationships to keep us. And we will be single-minded on the task that is in front of us. So never let comfort, never let family or any meaningful relationship or anything else take your eyes off of following Jesus with your entire being. Again, I close with a quote from Warren Wiersbe. Jesus is not suggesting here that we dishonor our parents, but only that we permit our love for family, uh, that we do not permit our love for family to weaken our love for the Lord. We should love Christ so much that our love for family would look like hatred in comparison. Luke 14, 26. That's a lot of love, isn't it? That's a lot of devotion to the kingdom of God and to him. But this is what the Lord wants. And he's a worthy king, isn't he? He's paid a big price. He has the authority and he has the right to say this is what I want my people to look like when they follow me not double minded not evaluating me well you know I'm just I'm I'm really weighing out things about Jesus Jesus says if you want to follow me you follow me but if you're going to look back you're not fit for the kingdom of God the Lord calls us to be in completely to following him so six essentials of the kingdom of God is that we must come with faith and prayer for those needs that arise for the evil day. We must understand that the cross was necessary for the Lord and we must keep it ever before us. We need to walk in humility. We need to walk in unity. We need to have a love and a patience for those that are maybe giving us a rough time about the gospel. And we need to be 
single-minded in our pursuit of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your son that you sent him to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that he went to the cross and that even when he was tempted to go away and even his companions not understanding it and saying don't do it, he was obedient to you. He knew what he was called to. But because he went to the cross, we have the hope of forgiveness. We have the hope of everlasting life. We thank you for that, Lord. Just give you a moment to search your heart. What is it? How is the Lord speaking to you? Faith and prayer, the centrality of the cross, humility, unity, love and patience, single-mindedness. Where is the Lord speaking to you? And you know, have an ear open for him to affirm you maybe in some of these areas too. Maybe what the Lord would want to say to you is, well done. I love your faith. He commended people for faith, didn't he? Lord, we pray that you would make us ready for the evil day. And maybe some of us are in that day right now. We're in that season. We're, we're down in the valley of, of attack, not on the mountain of, of glory. Lord, I pray that you would manifest your power and your strength to those that find themselves in that place. Lord, we know that there's nothing that hinders you. And so we just ask that you would move, Lord. We ask that you would move in our lives, that you'd move in the lives of those around us, that if we're called upon tonight or tomorrow or next month, that we will be so connected with you that we'll be ready to, to be used by you to liberate and see people find you, Lord. We pray for that. We pray for this coming season. Easter, Lord, we pray you bring many people out that don't know you, that are caught up, and that, Lord, you would just, it would be, it would be Liberation Sunday. You would just set people free from sin, from death, from disease. Lord, we know this is what is needed in our day. These people need to see your power manifested in the church. And so we pray for that. We pray for it, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.